Father in heaven, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come to you once again. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We ask that you'll pour out your spirit upon us as we open your word. Help us, Father, to be like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jonathan, this mic is not on. There we go, amen. Now, I want to look at a study this morning. And I want to preface this with this. And this morning, we're actually, we're going to study something. And, and I want to preface it with this thought. In Adventism, there are a lot of different uh, sex, I would guess, I, I would say. And you look and you see that we copy ancient Israel. Ancient Israel had the Sadducees, it had the, the Pharisees, it, it had all of these different sects. And each one of these different sects, they were still uh, Jews, but they had their various teachings. And in Adventism, the, the very same thing exists today. There are various teachings, and one of the problems, we went to a church once before, and we sat down because there was a teaching, and, 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 and we're going to deal with that uh, on one of these coming Sabbaths. But there was a teaching that was becoming prevalent in that church, and one of the things that each and every one of us saw, there were a group of ministers that came and we wanted to study out this teaching uh, amongst ourselves and amongst the people that were teaching it. And one of the things that we saw that majority of the, the, the various type of doctrines that are finding their way into Adventism, but even more so into what we would term present truth. And what we, when we say that, we're talking about people that are into reforms, people that are into dress reform and, and, and the health reform. And one of the things that we found is that many people are studying themselves out of the truth. A lot of these different doctrines are gaining sway with people that are studying the Bible. And they'll have someone that comes in and they'll introduce some strange teaching and it sounds good. But there's one thing wrong with it. Look what the Bible says in the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians. There's one thing wrong with the doctrine. The Bible says this in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Look what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto a what? Another gospel. Now we defined what the gospel is. Verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And so this other gospel is the very same gospel that we have, but it's perverted. Does that make sense? So it's a little twist. So what you'll see is a whole lot of truth, a whole lot of righteous, good teaching, but one little error. And that one little bit of error will cause the whole gospel to be perverted. And we looked and we saw that Adam and Eve, Eve, Satan told Eve a whole bunch of truth, one lie. Everything, when you look at what he said to her, all of what he said was true, except for, ye shall not surely die. That was the only lie he told. And as a result of this, Look at the condition that we're in. And so we want to study various teachings over the next few Sabbaths. And one of them we want to look at, we want to look at Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel 9 is a popular teaching that is creeping into the church. And so we want to take a look this morning at the book of Ezekiel chapter 9. Now I'm not going to tell you and I'm not going to promote what others teach. Amen? 
I'm not going to say, well, some people teach this and they... We're not going to promote that. I actually want to let you see where Ezekiel 9 is taking us to so that when someone introduces you the error of Ezekiel chapter 9, we'll be able to say, no, 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 the Bible says this. So if you're taking notes today, it'd be good so that you could keep track and you'd be able to go to it later. Look what the Bible says. We're going to read a few verses. As a matter of fact, let's read verses 1 through 11 together. And then we're going to go back and we're going to look and see what some of these verses actually mean. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 1. The Bible says, Ezekiel is in vision. He says, He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by a side and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar and the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house and he called to the man clothed with linen which had the writer's inkhorn by his side and the Lord said unto him go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And to the others, the remaining five of the six. And to the others, he said in my hearing, go ye after him. Now you want to keep that in mind. Do they go before him? So they go after, this is, we're going to come back to this point. So they're going after the writer with the inkhorn, or the, the man with the writer's inkhorn on his side. They're following him, and what are they going to do? Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Say utterly old and young, both maids and the little children and, wi and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. Do you see why he must come after him? Because first the mark must be placed so that he could identify who not to smite. Let's move forward. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left, and I, that I fell upon my face, and I cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem. So, now let's keep this in mind too. Another point we want to come back to. The slaying of all that did not have the mark was the pouring out of the fury of God. Is that a true statement? Is that a true statement? You with me, saints? Okay. Then said he, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. As for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I I have done as thou hast commanded. So we, so when we, we look here, we see the completion of the work. We see three stages here. We see number one, a man set to place a mark on those that sigh and cry. Then the other five were sent out to slay all those who did not have this mark. And then we see the work being completed. Now let's look here. Let's go back now. Let's bring out some defining characteristic now. Ezekiel 9, chapter 1. It says, He cried also in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. So the six that were commissioned to do this work were those that had what? Over the city. What did they have over the city? 
Okay? You know why I ask you questions, right? Anybody know why I ask questions? Elder, why do I ask questions? Huh? He said to keep y'all awake. Amen. That's one reason. Amen. That's fair. Number two, I want to see that you're getting it. When I ask you questions, I'm asking because I want to make sure that you're understanding. Because how we're going to do this study this morning is we're going to go from point to point, And each point will lead us to the next location. So if you miss an area, I want you to stop me and say, Preacher, I didn't get that, okay? And so that way you understand, and you're going to see where, you're go where we're going in this. The Bible says, cause them that have charge over the city. So those that had charge over the city are those that he is speaking to. Who are those that have charge over the city? Go with your Bibles to the book of Job. The book of Job 34. And we're going to see who these are that he's speaking to. It's key, saints, because when we see the error that is introduced, we will see who God is speaking to. And the Bible says in Job 34, J-O-B, Job, verse, chapter 34, and the Bible says in verse 13, Job chapter 34 and verse 13, the Bible says, who hath given him a what? A charge over the earth, or who hath disposed the whole world? So here, the, Job is asking the same question. Who, who has given this charge over the earth? Well, who is it that has this charge or this rulership or this guidance and direction? Look what the Bible says in the book of Psalms 91. Psalms 91, who, is these, who are these six men that have this charge? Psalms 91, look what the Bible says in verse 11. Psalms 91 and verse 11, the Bible says, For he shall give whom? His angels what? So who are those that are given charge? The angels, he says, he shall give his angels charge over thee. Now I want you to write down two verses. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 14. Paul is speaking to the, book of, uh, of the, the people in Galatia. And he's telling them that they received him as an angel. He compared himself to an angel. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 17. As a matter of fact, we want to read that verse. I like that verse. Let's go to Revelation 21, 17. So the charge is given to the angel, and oftentimes in the Bible, in Bible prophecy, an angel is referred to as mankind. And so we have to decide now whether this is a literal angel or whether it's going to be a man. And we're going to, the Bible's going to give us some proof about that. But let me show you this comparison once again so that you understand where I'm going now. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 17, the Bible says, And he measured the wall thereof, and hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a what? That is of an angel so the angel is transferable with the man do you remember when when the angel came to john and he bowed down and he what did the angel say see thou do it not i am thy fellow servant he told him i'm just like you I, and what 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 makes me just like you is because an angel is simply a messenger an um, angel has a message to bear so we asked ourselves now in Ezekiel chapter 9, are these literal men that God is asking to go in and out of the church to look for a mark that is on his people, and if his people do not have a mark, that they are commissioned, five of them, that they will be commissioned to slay everyone that does not have the mark. See, I'd be scared. See, if we had that teaching, true enough, you, you, you'd, you'd be scared to, to play in church. Amen? If you knew that, that at any given time, God would commission somebody to stand up with a slaughtering weapon and destroy everyone that's not sighing and crying for the abominations, you'd kind of be scared to go to church if you're not completely surrendered to God. Amen? 
But let's see whether or not, first of all, let's look at the mark. In order for us to decide whether or not these are literal angels or figurative angels, let's first look at the mark that is set upon the forehead. Because when you look at this prophecy, one thing about prophecy, I'll say this first. Prophecy we know has a literal application as well as a future application. But one thing you cannot do with prophecy, you cannot take a prophecy, make it both figurative and literal at the same time. Did you understand what I mean? Let me explain to you. The destruction of Jerusalem, that was a literal prophecy. It was also a future prophecy for a prophesied of the destruction of the world and the second coming of Jesus Christ. One prophecy, dual application. But the symbols, when you look at it literally, you cannot apply the symbols figuratively at the same time. Does that make sense? No, it didn't. Okay, I got to figure out another way to explain it then. Didn't make sense. If in, let me, okay, in Daniel chapter 2, let's look at Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, there is a, there's gold, there's different types of metal, there's stones. If I look at Daniel chapter 2 and I say that these metals are literal, I cannot give them a spiritual application when I get to the feet. Everything either is literal or everything is either spiritual. Do you understand? When you have due application, it is either one or the other when you're dealing with the prophecy. So if this angel is literal, then all of the angels are literal. Does that make sense? If this angel is a figurative, speaking of men, then all of them must be. Does that make sense? Look what the Bible says now, and we're talking about this mark that's placed upon their forehead. Look what the Bible says. In the book of uh, uh, um, Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 2. You want to keep your finger in Ezekiel chapter 9. You want to keep your finger right there in Ezekiel chapter 9. Look what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 9. It says in verse 2. It says, And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lie toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man that was what? Among them. So it was six of them. One of them is just like the rest of them, but he has the writer's ink horn. And he is told, in verse 3, to place... It says, and the glory of the Lord, no, no, in verse 4, and it says, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the midst of the land. Now we're talking about this mark. First, who gets this mark? The mark is for those that are sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in the land. Turn from your Bibles to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 1. The book of Lamentations chapter 1. Look what the Bible says in verse 4. Lamentations chapter 1. In verse 4, the Bible says, The ways of Zion do what? Mourn, because none come to the solemn feast. All her gates are desolate. Her priests do what? That word sigh in that verse and the same in the other simply means to mourn, to cry, to be in bitterness over something. But when you add the word cry to it, it brings out a little bit more of a definition. Look what the Bible says in the book of Psalms. Those that are sighing and crying, Psalms 55, some of you may know this verse, Psalms 55, the Bible says in verse 17, Psalms 55 and verse 17. The Bible says, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and do what? And cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. So those that are sighing and crying 
for the abominations are done in the land are those that are weeping and spending time in prayer for the apostasy that they see. Now remember what we said once before, how the problem with present truth is that when we become people who are practicing reforms, there is the very easy opportunity for us to put our nose up a little bit and look down on people. Because we say they should know better. They should know better. How many times have you been to a place and, 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 and people are talking about things that are going on in churches that they just left from because they should know better. And, and it's almost as if there's no pity, there's no compassion. But when we look at the prayer, look what the Bible says. Look at the prayer of, of, of Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter 9. Look at the prayer of Daniel. Daniel is an example of one who is sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in the land. Look at Daniel chapter 9 says. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 3. The Bible says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have what? Well, wait a minute. Daniel wasn't amongst the apostasy of the children of Israel. He wasn't participating in the sins that they were participating in. So why did he say we have sinned? Because he associated himself with the people of God. And he says, Lord, help your people. We have sinned. This is an example of one who's sighing and crying for the abominations. Turn for your Bible to the book of Lamentation again. The book of Lamentations chapter 2. Lamentations chapter 2. We're still talking about this mark, but first, who receives this mark? Lamentations chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 19, Those that sigh and that cry, the Bible says, Arise, cry out in the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Why? Why? Lift up thine hands toward him for the life of thy young children that faint in the street. So the Bible says that this crying represents basically intercessory prayer. So those that are receiving this mark are those that are interceding. Those that are seeing the apostasy that's going on in the church. And instead of talking about people, they're spending time praying for people. Listen what the prophet of the Lord says. She says in Review and Herald, February 20, 1913. She says, we are not to be like men who said, I have prayed and prayed, but I do not receive. A companion said to him, let us pray together. Then and claim the promise of God. So they bowed in prayer. But when they rose from the knees, the man said, I do not feel any different, and I didn't expect that I should. This is the way that many present themselves before God. They would be surprised if God should answer their prayers. They do not expect the Lord to answer their prayers, nor think that the Lord will hear them. And their petitions are in vain, for they go away the same as they came. She says in volume 6 of the testimony, solicit prayer for the souls for whom you labor. Present them before the church as subjects for their supplication. It would be just what the members of the church need to have their mind called from their petty difficulties, to feel a great burden, a personal interest for the souls that is ready to perish. Select another and still another, daily seeking guidance from God, laying everything before him in earnest prayer. As you do this, God will give you the Holy Spirit to convict and convert the souls. Basically, don't be weary in well-doing. Those that are sighing and crying are those that are praying for what they see taking place. And they're not stopping. They're not giving up. What is this mark? What is this mark? So the mark is placed on those that are praying 
for the abominations that they see taking place in the church. They're not disassociating themselves. They're not pulling up their robes to make sure they don't get touched by the filthy people. But the Bible says this in Ezekiel, not Ezekiel, in Revelation chapter 7. For the mark is placed on their forehead. Now look who is placing the mark on the forehead in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, we want to look at verse 1. The Bible says this, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have done what? Sealed the servants of our God where? Where is the mark placed in Ezekiel 9? On the forehead. Where is the sealing angel placing the seal? On the forehead. Is this a man doing this or is this an angel doing this? This is an angel. Therefore, the other five must be angels as well. But listen to what the verse says. How do we know that they go together? It says, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, until we have done what? Until we have placed the mark in their forehead, right? So therefore, after the mark is placed, what could then happen? How about in Revelation chapter 7? What could happen after the seal is placed? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we come to you this morning. In your word there is life. In your word there is strength. You have designed for a specific purpose to take place as we study your word. I pray that each and every one of us, myself included, may be in tune with your spirit so that we may receive of you that which you have to offer to us today. May your grace be sufficient because we are weak without your strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. According to Revelation chapter 7, he said, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, until my servants are sealed in their forehead. So after they're sealed, then the angels could let loose this wind. Then destruction could take place. In Ezekiel 9, we saw that after the mark was placed, then the slaughtering angels were able to go through. Now this seal is synonymous with the word sign. Go with me a Bible to the book of Romans chapter 4. The seal is synonymous with sign. Romans chapter 4. We want to go to the book of Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And look what the Bible says in verse 11. Romans chapter 4 verse 11, a seal is synonymous with a sign. And he's placing a seal in their forehead. The Bible says in Romans chapter 11, chapter 4, sorry, in verse 11, it says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a what? A seal of the righteousness of the faith. So sign and seal are the same thing. You can interchange that word because he said the sign of circumcision, it is the seal of righteousness. They are one and the same. So then the servants are sealed in their forehead. What is this seal or sign that the servants are sealed with? What did you say? The truth. They're sealed with the truth. Amen. Amen. Look what the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel. Yes. The Sabbath is our sign. Look what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. 
Ezekiel chapter 20. And we're going through this so that we can see how both of these two chapters go inside. How Ezekiel 9 will coincide with Revelation chapter uh, 7. Because remember, they're sealed in their forehead. A sign is a seal. And we're getting ready to see that that sign represents the Sabbath. Ezekiel chapter 20, the Bible says in verse 12... Moreover also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a what? To be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. So those that are sealed are those that are crying for what is being done in the church. And their sealing that they're sealed with is the Sabbath. It is the seventh day Sabbath. So back in Ezekiel chapter 9... Look what it says in verse 1. How do we know that the Sabbath is in play here in Ezekiel chapter 9? Look what it says in verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 1. The Bible says, He cried what? Also. He cried also. Also is a, is a word that brings two things together. It's a conjunction. Amen? Is, is that right? So the word also is referring to the fact that something else either is going to happen or more likely has already taken place. See, the vision of Ezekiel 8 is compared with the vision of Ezekiel 9. And look what Ezekiel 8 verse 16 is talking about. Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 16. The Bible says, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. And what did they do? And they worshipped the sun in the east. So their backs is towards the temple. And at the very furthest part of the temple in the west, we find the most holy place. We find victory over sin, righteousness by faith. Their backs are towards the temple. And they're looking towards the east. And they're worshiping the sun. Sun worship. They have given up the Sabbath. And now... They are keeping Sunday in place of the Sabbath. How do we know that? Look what the Bible says in Second Peter. Look what the Bible says in the book of Second Peter. Second chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two and verse twenty one. Second Peter chapter two and verse twenty one. We're going to bring out a couple more points and then we're going to close. Second Peter chapter two and verse twenty one. One of the things that I often do with prophecy, I look for time frames. I know that time is no more, but there are events that we look for now. And so I look for time frames. And when I say time frames, I'm looking for particularly events to take place. And I put those in line with prophecy. And then we can know where the prophecy fits in. And that's what I did with this prophecy. And God is going to show us an event, a time frame. Well, we could place Ezekiel chapter 9. Look what the Bible says in verse 29 of 21 of Second Peter chapter 2. It says, For it had better be for them, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from what does that word say? What does it say? To turn from the holy commandments. Right? Is that what it says? Commandment, singular. So God says it would have been better for them not to have known than to know, to know it, and to turn from the holy commandment. Not commandments. Not the Ten Commandments. But the holy commandments. There's only one commandment out of the ten that is considered holy. You look through all of them. Not one of them say they're holy. Except for the fourth commandment. Here in 2 Peter, we have a, a group of people that have once kept the Sabbath and have turned away. Listen to what the prophet of the Lord says. Great Controversy, page 605. But not one is made to suffer the wrath of God 
until the truth has been brought home to his mind. She says, not one. Remember, we read, Lord, are you going to pour out your fury? She says, not one. And this included everybody. Church folk, bad folk, everybody. Not one is made to suffer the wrath of God until the truth has been brought home to his mind and conscience and has been eject, rejected. There are many who have never had an opportunity to hear the special truth for this time. The obligation of the fourth commandment has never been set before them in his true light. He who reads every heart and tries every motive will leave none who desire to kn the knowledge of the truth to be deceived as to the issue of the controversy. Now listen to this. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth, especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. So the Sabbath will be that dividing line. The sheep on the right, the goats on the left, those that have the mark of God's authority, those that have the mark of the beast's authority. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the state of the law, with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be a vow of allegiance to the power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is evidence of the loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly power, receives the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receives the seal of God. So the seal of God being God's Sabbath, simultaneously those that refuse God's law will receive a seal as well then we go to this verse now after as a matter of fact after the seal then remember God's wrath is now poured out so now who is commissioned to do this this work of the smiting Look what the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah. 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 The book of Jeremiah, we want to go to chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50. So those that... The angel that did the sealing, we must conclude that those that are doing the destroying are also the angels of, as well. For we look and we see in Revelation chapter 7 verse 2, it says that the angels are holding the four wind. So when they let it loose, then God will release his weapons. Well, what is his weapons? Verse 25, look what the Bible says. Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 25, the Bible says, The Lord hath opened his armory and hath brought forth the weapons of his indignation. For this is the work of the Lord of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans. So the Bible says that God let loose his weapons upon the Chaldeans, right? Well, what are his weapons? That was verse 25. Well, what are the Lord's weapons? Let's look at verse 40 now. Let's see what he did to the Chaldeans. Because remember, he told the, 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 the angels to take your weapons and use these weapons to destroy. Well, what are God's weapons? Verse 40. The Bible says, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, he's still talking to the Chaldeans. He says in verse 35, a sword is upon the Chaldeans. Verse 40, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Well, how did God, what weapons did God use to overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire and brimstone. Well, let's look at another spot. Go from your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. What are God's weapons? Isaiah chapter 13. Look what the Bible says in verse 5. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 5. 
The Bible says they come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his what? indignation or of his wrath or of his fury to destroy the whole land. Well, Lord, what are your weapons? Look what the Bible says in verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellation thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in this going forth and the moon shall not cease her light to shine. He says in verse 9 that he would use these to destroy sinners. So what are God's weapons? God's weapons are nature. Look at, look at this, how many stories have we seen when we look at Pharaoh being destroyed as he was attacked in, attacking the children of Israel. What did God use to destroy him? What was God's weapons then? It was the Red Sea. What was God's weapons when, when David was fighting the Ammonites? God's weapons were stones that fell from the sky. The Bible says that more, more stones killed the Ammonites than the children of Israel altogether. God's weapons, it's nature. Well, look what the Bible says in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15. Because remember, the Bible said that God, His weapons were the weapons of his indignation. The Bible says this in Revelation chapter 15 and verse 7. And the angels have God's weapons. The Bible says in verse 7, And one of the four beasts gave unto the angels seven golden vials full of the what? Wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. Well, what are these vials that are full with the wrath of God? Verse 1 of the same chapter. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the what? Seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. Listen to this quote. Prophet Lord says, Prophet Lord says in Review and Herald, October 8, 1901. When the Savior saw in the Jewish people a nation divorced from God, he also saw a professed Christian church united to the world and the papacy. He saw two things at the same time. He saw their day and he saw our day. And as he stood upon Olivet, weeping over Jerusalem till the sun sank behind the western stars, so he is weeping and pleading with sinners in these last moments of time. Now listen to what he compares this now. Soon he will say to the angels who are holding the four winds, or to those in Ezekiel chapter 9 that are commissioned to smite, let the plagues loose. Let darkness and destruction and death come upon the transgressors of my law. Will he be obliged to say to those who have great light and knowledge, as he said to the Jews, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. So the prophet Lord says, she compares the holding of the winds, or the releasing of the winds, to the falling of the last plagues. So when we look to Ezekiel chapter 9, we're seeing the same thing. In Ezekiel chapter 9, we're seeing the angel setting the seal upon those that are being faithful. We're seeing those that are rejecting the truth, continually rejecting the truth. And God is causing a line to be drawn in the sand. Choose you this day whom you will serve. He is, ca he is causing a line of demarcation to take place. And when those that have accepted Christ are, have received their seal, then those who have consistently rejected Christ, Christ can say, there's no more that I could do. There's nothing else that I could do. Why is this important to us today? As a matter of fact, there are those who say that the weapons represent the sword and we would come through with the sword. Well, the sword represents the word of God in Bible prophecy. Is that not right? Well, look what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 22 about the word of God. 
Look what it says about the word of God, about this sword being the word of God. Revelation chapter 22. The Bible says this in verse 18. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 18. It says, For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him what? So in direct comparison to how you handle the word of God is how you're going to be treated by God. Is that fair? So if you add to God's word, the Bible says you're going to add to the plagues. But what happens if you take away from the word of God? Look at verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. If you add, God will add. You take away, God will take away. And so what destroys men? How does the word of God destroy men? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why, Lord? Because thou hast rejected knowledge. Rejection of the word of God is what brings destruction to mankind. God is not asking anybody. He's not asking any one of you or me to go through and discern the character of our brother. Is that fair? Do you understand what I mean? God is not asking anybody. That's why the Spirit reproves us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Your sins and your lack of righteousness so that you can make a choice, so that you can be faithful. God is never asking us to place our eyes upon each other. Then we could, if, if He were asking us to do that, and He was empowering us to do that, then, then maybe it may be understandable that God would call upon me to discern and to be able to cut out those who are living unfaithfully. Yes, by your fruits ye shall know them. So when somebody comes and he's puffing a cigarette, it's fair to me to say he's a smoker. Is that right? Somebody listening to worldly music and, 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 and doing these other things, I could discern their actions and I could speak positively or negatively about their actions. But the motives of their hearts, I cannot say. No one would have ever known about the young man we talked about before. That would be on his knees, on, uh, on the side of his bed, crying and asking God for forgiveness. To leave out of his house the next morning. To tote guns, smoke marijuana and sell drugs. Every night, well not every night, but many a time, be found beside his bed weeping because he does not want to do what he believes is the only choice for him in life. So we could discern his actions. We could judge his actions. I could say he's a drug dealer. I could say he's a gangbanger. But I don't know what his heart's like. I don't know what his relationship with God is like. And God is not asking us to discern that in one another. These are angels that will do this work. Why is it important to us? Because God has given final warnings. God is sharing with us what is getting ready to take place. There is a line that's being drawn. And it's not enough to eat right. It's not enough to dress right. There's even a danger as we begin this. There's even a danger in our study habit. Because we can study. But without the Spirit of God directing and guiding our studies. We'll believe every win a doctrine that comes along. Because it sounds good. Sounds good. And it fits. I sat down with someone not too long ago, saints, and, 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 we, and we looked at a particular prophecy. As a matter of fact, we looked at Daniel chapter 2. And I love Daniel chapter 2. I mean, it's one of my favorite studies. But we looked at Daniel chapter 2, and we was looking at certain things, and, and, and everything they were presenting, it was fitting. Amen? It sounded good. It looked nice. But I introduced one thing. You know, I threw a monkey wrench in there. And I gave them time frame. The time frame of the chaff. I said the time frame of the chaff represents the executive phase of the judgment. How does that fit? See, everything else fit if you left one piece of the puzzle out. And that's what Satan does with us. 
So even our study habit without the Spirit of God guiding the directors can lead us to despair. We need the Holy Ghost. And so God reveals this for a couple of reasons. Look what the Bible says in the book of 2 Peter as we prepare to close this morning. 2 Peter. 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 8, the Bible says in verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that what? that it all should come to repentance. Second Chronicles. But that all should come to repentance. God says, I'm sharing this with you. I tell you before it happens that when it come to pass, ye may believe. I'm trying to prepare people. In one way or the other, we're going to be a people prepared. Does that make sense? One way or the other, we will be a prepared people. Either we're going to be a people prepared to spend eternity with God. I don't believe it's a fairy tale. Either we're going to be a people prepared to eat off the tree of life. To follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. Or we're going to be a people prepared to spend eternity as ashes. As ashes. One way or the other, we're going to be prepared. And God says this in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. It says in verse, and we begin in verse 15, it says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people in all his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his word and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no what? Until the plagues had to be poured out. Because God says there's nothing else I could do for them. There's nothing else I could do. They have tied my hands. They have refused warning after warning. Ephraim is joined to his idol. Let him alone. And so the question I leave with you is a question that God asks many people. The book of Ezekiel, our last verse. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 30. Our final verse as we close. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 30. This is what prophecy is for brothers and sisters. Not so that we can get sidetracked and, and debating uh, 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 who's, who, whether Uriah Smith had the right view or, or, or whether the patriots or, or, or whether they, they, their views are, are no longer valid, whether God is giving us new light. These are side issues that, that distract us from the main point of what prophecy is to point us to. And prophecy is to point us to the fact that Jesus Christ is soon to return. Are you ready? The Bible says this, Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord. Repent, because I will judge you. Repent and turn yourself from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye transgress. And make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? That's what God asked us today. Why will you die? Why would you hang on to your old character if your old character has only gotten to where you are today? I was praying the other morning and I was telling the Lord. I said, Lord, I want to be holy. I want to live holy. I want to live righteously. I want to have victory in every area. 
And the Lord said to me, saints, you are what you're going to be. Do you get it? What you're going to be is what you are right now. Therefore, if you don't like what you are right now, change it so that you'll be something different. Don't expect a change in the future if you won't allow a change today. God is not going to wave a magic wand and make us something that we're not willing to put any effort into achieving today. And for God says, why will you die? Will you let me produce righteousness in you? When he says, make you a new heart, that goes along with the promise of Ezekiel chapter 36, 26 and 27. A new heart also will I give you. So what are we making? We're just making room. We're just giving God permission to give us that new heart and that new actions. Therefore, that new life. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we come to you this day. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that is constantly striving with us to cause us to see our need and then empowering us to make a choice for righteousness. Today we choose you. Today as a result of your Spirit even present in this room and in our lives right now, today we choose to give you our heart. Today we choose to allow you to make a change so that we could see and live what we believe we should live and how we should act. If today you want to surrender your heart to Christ of friends, I simply want you to ask you to raise your hand. Today you raise your hand saying, Lord, I want to surrender my heart afresh. I want you to make changes in my life. That will allow me to be the man of God. That picture of righteousness. Not that somebody else has painted for me. But that picture of righteousness that you have painted for myself. Lord let me live up to the standard that you show me that I should live up to. And then when I live up to that standard. Lord by your power you could drive me. You could push me to live even holier still. Today we surrender our hearts to Christ afresh. And Lord, we thank you for accepting us. Not because we are worthy. But because you love us. And you died for us. Yea, rather you live for us even now. So we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.